Thank you everyone for coming to today's Ask Us Anything webinar. Today we are going to be talking specifically about inventory platforms and uh, just as a little bit of housekeeping here, um, I'm going to talk about just the format. So we'll have just a quick little introduction to the topics that we're going to be speaking about today. Uh, we will break down a little bit of the semantics of uh, what certain things mean. Uh, and then we will be answering questions that have been sent in in advance by you, the attendees. Um, at the end of the session, we have an opportunity for live questions. So if there are any things that pop up during today's session and you would like to have us answer them, head over to the Q&A section of Zoom and enter them there and we will answer them at the end of the webinar. So let's jump into it. My name is Matthew Grant and I am the new business director at Waypoint and I'll be moderating this session today. Um, for context, uh, if you met us at ZeroCon, you would have probably spoken to me. I'd say there's probably about a 90% chance of that. Um, I look after people at the start of their client journey with us. I also look after strategic partnerships at Waypoint. Um, and joining me today for this conversation, which will be fairly informal, it'll be a bit of back and forth between Dan and I uh, so that we can answer your questions. We have Dan Fairbairn. Say hi, Dan. Hey. So Dan runs the business, uh, but he also heads up our most complex implementations. So obviously we, Waypoint, we put in uh, quite complex at times uh, software implementation projects into uh, our client businesses and uh, where there are lots of things going on behind the scenes, particularly with inventory, where you've got complex manufacturing, uh, let's say, EDI, 3PL, multiple e-commerce, uh, and everything needs to talk. Um, Dan is the brains behind the scene here. He knows how to do it and how to do it well. Um, so what I want to talk about very quickly is addressing a question that we get asked every now and then. So it's basically our credentials. Who are we? Why, why do we have the right to talk to anyone about this stuff? Uh, so we are... If you're in the Zero ecosystem, you're probably familiar with the cloud integrator model that Zero operate. Um, they have a bit over 300 uh, in that pool of uh, implementation providers, and they have a very small subsection of that called preferred. There's only about eight of us, and we are one of those preferred implementation providers. We've been in that program since day one, and we have literally put in hundreds of projects successfully into client operations. Um, when it comes to inventory solutions, um, we are market leaders in what we do. Um, and uh, certainly we've got uh, the references and, and the backup to prove it. So today, just very quickly, we're talking about a very simple term, inventory, but it means quite a lot. Uh, to break that down, in a business, we're just using it as shorthand for anything that involves the supply chain operations of an inventory-based business, and obviously the technology that affects that. Um, so that can be things like just simple product handling. Uh, it can be the manufacturing component of the business. So, you know, a simple or a complex bill of materials. It can be e-commerce and how that flow of data moves from sales channels uh, such as it or point of sale or uh, from a direct B2B portal uh, into uh, your inventory system and back out again. Um, it can be when we're talking about EDI connections. Uh, for context, EDI is when you uh, electronically connect your system to a supplier uh, system, such as uh, if you've got any clients that are working with some of the big department stores, some of them mandate EDI connection. So you don't send, as an example, an email purchase order. Say, hey, we need to buy X, Y, Z off you. Uh, they want that to all happen just with a click of a button and fire into their wholesaler systems. Um, similar deal with 3PL integration. So third-party logistics, having uh, a direct integration from an inventory system 
to a third party logistics provider. So there's no emails back and forth. Um, and we're also talking about systems that manage the accurate tracking of cost of goods sold or COGS. And in all cases, these types of solutions can be simple or they can be really quite complex. We've seen and done it all. And uh, the last thing I want to address before we jump into the questions is why we are uh, formatting the session in the way that we have. So why ask us anything rather than have a structured uh, presentation as such? And the main reason is because oftentimes we find that there are some very simple, straightforward questions that are really hard for you to get answers on. Um, when you go to software vendors directly, a lot of the times, you know, you end up in a sales funnel. Um, and just to get some simple answers, you know, you've got to sign up for demos and trials and all this sort of stuff and uh, get bombarded with uh, marketing collateral. And on the flip side of it, a lot of uh, the things that we discuss with our clients, some of that IP can be behind uh, a similar style process of, con of consultation. So we wanted to give everyone an opportunity and uh, given the success of these so far, we will probably do this again, where those questions that you think, well, I don't want to have to go through a meeting, you know, or a couple of meetings and scoping to find out these couple of little things. Um, our IP is here. We've got it in our brains and we're happy to share it. So uh, with that said, I'm going to jump into the questions that have been sent to us already. Now to give a bit of context here, um, as the moderator, I've prepared the questions and tried to structure them in some order that makes sense for us to answer them one after another. Um, I haven't given Dan these questions ahead of time to prep. So we want this to be kind of a, a fairly casual and off the cuff kind of conversation. Um, certainly we want to leverage what Dan knows about the industry and how these systems get implemented. Um, so I'm going to jump straight into it. Dan, are you ready to roll? Uh, yeah, you can hear me okay? Yep, can hear you okay. Perfect. And uh, so, first question that we've got here, um, it's a little bit of an industry-specific one, so I'm not sure, Dan, do you want to answer this now or later? It's about uh, stock management software being, uh, which stock management software would be suitable uh, for a meat supplier? Um, but we've also got some stuff later on that's a bit more industry-specific, so what do you want to do there? Um, Okay, really good question. Um, hold that question for the moment. First question, let's not answer it. Um, hold that question for a moment because there's probably a good little bit of context if we've got anything um, kind of broader um, that I'll kind of come back to that. The kind of best is always a difficult thing to answer, but I'll, I'll come back to that in a little bit if you don't mind um, and yeah. look yeah. at something a little bit more broad. Yeah, well, the uh, the segue then, and I, and I think where we can start building some relevance to answer this later, um, there's a question here, someone has asked, what are the best cloud inventory systems? So again, that the word best here, and what are the key differences between them? So you wanted broad, how's that for broad? Um, okay, cool, let's give it a go. Okay, so um, first of all, hello everyone and good morning. Um, so I'll try with most of these questions not to get too technical into things just being aware of a time um and b engagement um but obviously throw anything in the q a if, if you want to know anything more specific so um in terms of the cloud inventory system so most of what we work with uh links to either zero or quickbooks online generally if a platform links to one it will link to the other um there's a number of inventory platforms that work with both of those solutions. Um, going back to the first or one of the first slides that was there with a lot of the features on it, um, I'd be careful about the word inventory versus something that has manufacturing, third party logistics, full cost of goods and similar. So uh, to put this in a um, maybe some kind of areas, there's really small little platforms that can handle inventory. So down to like small point of sale systems like Square and Vend and similar. Um, generally, we don't tend to play in that area. They tend to be too small for some of our clients. Um, in terms of the more broad inventory solutions, probably the names that most people know 
uh, Sin 7, Unleashed, Dia, Trey Gecko are probably the four that kind of sit. Yeah, probably the four that come up the most. Yeah. Um, cards on the table for us, probably 70, 80% of clients head towards Dia um, for kind of cost versus value versus feature set. Um, generally, I would very broadly say, personal opinion only, Trey Gecko tends to be at the lower end of the feature set. There's a little bit less in terms of EDI production and similar. Um, it doesn't offer production at all. Yeah. Um, Deer Unleashed tend to be at a similar sort of level, Unleashed a little bit higher in pricing, a little bit less flexible in our opinion on some of the limits in the software and kind of um, movability of processes. Um, Sin 7 tends to be much at the higher end, especially when it comes to pricing. Um, there's a couple of little killer things there we'll probably talk about um, in some future questions, but that, that's probably where the, where the realm, where the market sits um, very roughly, but there are big, big differences between them. Definitely one key piece of advice I would, I would give people, and we'll, we'll probably get into it depending on what other questions are, is just watching out for the word inventory in a in a feature or similar where it can mean um not very much more than just a stock count with nothing behind it um mm. to be very honest yeah yeah um there's uh, a couple of things around uh, market so types of industries and things like that as well certainly that you know it really does depend on uh it really depends on the requirements i, I guess like you know it, cost of goods sold. How does the client calculate cost of goods sold? Do they do it over, uh, they do it as first in first out or do they do it as an average? Um, some systems do average, some systems do FIFO. So that's a real good one. Um, Cause certainly a lot of the other things like, you know, managing unique SKUs, managing the prices, the buy prices, multiple suppliers, um, you know, those kinds of things are ubiquitous. All of the systems do that. Um, yeah, you, you're right. Um, there are things that something like, say, Trade Gecko doesn't have, so it doesn't have uh, production or advanced uh, inventory or product tracking. So things like batch tracking and serial numbers, I don't believe are in it. Could be wrong about serial numbers, but um, but there's things like that. Um, but once you get into the systems that handle that, most of the functionality I find, if you were to just put it on a grid and you know do a competitor analysis chart they all tick most of the same boxes. Mm -hmm. um, there's nuance in the way that it handles things that make things a little bit different um, across I'd, the board. I'd say similar with that. So, but I, I'd say for most people, um, and this will probably come back around to that specific question about the industry just before. So there's definite tick boxes against a lot of the solutions. So you, you can definitely say, and I, and I would tell people to start there. So if you know, I need batch tracking, I need EDI, because as you said at the beginning, it's mandated in some cases now. Um, that's going to knock some things off straight away off of a kind of list of, of systems to look at. Um, I'd start there at least to whittle things down. Um, you're completely right then. So we did a similar webinar yesterday on professional services. Professional services is a lot more subjective. Inventory, without being too simplistic, um, Box moving is fairly discreet. There's obviously some fun with, you know, credits and shipping and integrations and things, but broadly a product comes in, you may manufacture it into something else. Someone places an order, you ship it out. So um, I'd look first at the feature sets of a solution if you're looking at something um, uh, to make sure that you've got the basics of what you need. And also limits. There are some solutions that have like product limits, order limits, things like that. Um, then really, and this kind of goes back to my point about our preferences, I'd look at workflows, flexibility, um, and probably especially given I know that we've got quite a few people from ZeroCon and accountants in the room, um, integrations as well. I'll, I'll hold it in case we get, I, I don't know if we'll get a particular question on it, but if not towards the end, I might talk a little bit about why all integrations are not equal, um, but we'll kind of get to that a little bit further along. Cool. Um, one last little thing that I want to add to that, and I think we'll touch on this a little bit later because there is a question sort of about this, but uh, I thought 
let's uh, yeah, let's let's bring it up now. So once you've gone through that process and you've kind of looked at the tick box requirements, um, there's a little bit of time that's going to be needed, and I think it really it really is going to come down to not worrying about focusing too much on sales led demos from software vendors. I think it's kind of got to be the other way around. I think, you know, once you've whittled down the list, there's a point at which you need to uh, either yourself or your clients need to kind of walk their process towards the, the salespeople at the, at the software platform. Um, they, you know, so, take the sales hat off for a second and think, okay, what do they see on a daily basis? They see what they see the people that activate and they see the people that cancel. Um, and they know the thing, the reasons why people cancel from their software platform. So they'll be looking for those um, going in where it's the software vendor pitching to you. Uh, I think actually can be a little bit, of the wrong way of approaching it because if you take it that way every vendor is going to tell you that they're the best platform for you flip it the other way and give them all the reasons why they should not take you on as a client um you know and all that kind of complexity and certainly it's how it's how we approach work so we get people to show us their workflows and how they do things because we're not looking to qualify people in we're looking to qualify people out i think that's the way that you find the right platform uh, either for yourself or your clients. Yeah, agree. I, I, and going back to what I mentioned about feature kind of tick boxes and things, it's, it's. I mean, I, I've mentioned seven, eight solutions if we include some of the simple pods and things. There's there's hundreds, um, mm. If you, especially if you go out of cloud solutions and into older server ones and into mobile ones and similar. Um, I totally agree. I, I qualify out, not qualify in. If you try and work out like, okay, what will handle 500 SKUs? Well, every system will. Um, I'd look at, yeah, what doesn't it do? What can't it handle? Mm. Um, being careful not to focus on the 1% of your process. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I definitely say the same. Yeah. Um, so then it segues into a similar question about point of sale. Um, something that we get asked a fair bit, actually. So what are some good POS platforms for clients with volume inventory? Now, that's that's the qualifier on this question. So, yeah, clients that have quite a high volume of product that they move through, but in a more brick-and-mortar POS retail environment. Uh, okay, so good, good question. So, um, so there's, I'll kind of frame this question in a similar way. So there's a few... POS platforms that people have probably heard. I'm kind of making assumptions here just based on registration information of, of kind of OZ based. Um, and we've got a few accountants and advisors in the room. So uh, there's a few POS names like Square, Vend, um, Shopify have their own POS, Deer have their own POS, and Seven have their own POS, um, Counter for Hospo, uh, Revel for Hospo as well. So there's, there's quite a few there. Um, Volume inventory is the interesting one. And obviously inventory is the kind of frame of what we're talking about here. So uh, generally, uh, just to rattle off kind of some free advice. So uh, counter and revel, generally more hospo focused. So just for clarification, generally more um, led on things like table layouts, um, tipping, um, and some of the like food fulfillment um, um, integrations and similar. Um, then there's probably a bit of a blend between solutions like Square and Vend and things that are POS focused, but can handle, again, air quotes, inventory and DSN7, which are more inventory led platforms that have POS as well. Um, I'd probably say the driver between the two. So a couple of these things have been mentioned already. Um, those that are POS leading solutions, so Square, Vend and similar, will generally simplify the inventory. It's not always a good thing, not always a bad thing. So they'll generally run on average cost, um, generally not batch track or serial track, uh, generally not run much production or similar. So if, if we're talking pure retail, good options and good solutions, um, 
the Deerance in Seven pos then generally leans on uh, both of those lean on their inventory credentials um, and have pos as a channel over the top of them. So they they will then allow the things that the um, wider inventory uh, program does, like serials, batches, um, production, um, all those kinds of things. Um, a flag I would, a couple of flags I would give on this, this is particularly to kind of advisors talking to their clients, um, are in relation to a few specific processes. Um, so things where we've seen clients get get hung up in the past. So we've got clients using Bend, we've got clients using Square, we've got clients using Sin7 POS, we've got clients using Dear POS. Um, a few of the things, um, and I could spend hours getting into the specifics, but that will tend to push you in one direction or the other. Um, E-commerce, interestingly, and the word that I absolutely hate, but omni-channel, especially when it comes to things like um, stock to store. Um, so as an example, if you have, let's say, a warehouse in Melbourne, but a couple of retail stores, if you want people to be able to do things like order stock to store or use gift vouchers or rewards or credits across channels, that needs some consideration. That tends to lean you more to the heavier end of things. Um, if you tend to sell through negative stock, that's a concept that kind of makes my ears bleed a little bit, but that tends to lead you to the smaller solutions because more pure breed inventory solutions like Deer Unleashed and Seven intentionally and rightly don't let you sell through negative stock. They'll let you back order things, but you can't ship out what you don't have. Um, the other one that I kind of flag for advisors is, uh, or other two or three are, are some POS nuances like uh, lay buys. Um, there are also a couple of integrations between things like Square, Vend, and things like Unleashed um, as well. I'd be somewhat wary of that because you can have some fun where a client does a lay buy, the retail platform thinks that product is gone, the inventory platform thinks it hasn't because they treat that logic kind of differently. Um, so my 20 minute answer to a simple question. <laughs> um, it's kind of horses for courses. Um, the biggest thing is probably in a similar way to looking at what the platform's core function is, I'd look at the same for the business. So assuming um, uh, you, the phrasing I think was volume inventory, assuming and we're understanding that right, I would look at those solutions for whom that's the core function, but that operate a POS internally versus the simpler solutions that are probably not going to have the weight required. Yeah. Um, really good points. And I, I think I would add something a little bit off, off the, to the side of that. So um, good POS solutions, if you're looking at an integrated environment, so you say you're looking at an inventory backbone um, and using another POS at, at the front end. So let's take a hypothetical here. For whatever reason, you're looking at... Uh, say deer inventory and you're comparing say deer's native point of sale versus having another point of sale integrated to deer so deer's got an open api you could do that that uh, integration could get written uh if the if there was a good enough um kind of need to do so you know there are people that can do that for you uh the thing that i would always hazard and this goes for custom integrations as well as the ones that are listed as approved between different software vendors uh, is which platform thinks it's in control of the inventory you can have the nicest pos in the world uh, you know but if it's fighting for control over the inventory list and so is your inventory system you're going to have a world of hurt and for the couple of little uh, bells and whistles that the pos system might might have you will undo the value by sitting there having to correct stock levels because one thinks it's in charge versus the other. Um, from, from our perspective, I think it, it's important to, again, put cards on the table and say, we think that the inventory backbone should be in charge of the inventory list. Um, it should basically be the centerpiece of your operations, POS, e-commerce, um, B2B, those, those types of sales channels. Uh, 
our input methods and slaves basically to the inventory system in our in our worldview. Um, I'm I might I don't know if we've got questions on it. Somebody might I might just jump on that point to talk. Uh, I mentioned about 10, 15 minutes ago. So not all integrations are built equally. Um, uh, I'll, I'll just make a couple of mentions there. So that's a good point. And, and for context, for our clients, generally the the add-on to use the zero terminology, so the, the operational application, so Deer Unleashed, Sin7, Ben, whatever, becomes the 90% of what a client does. Zero is obviously still important, so it handles payroll and compliance and, and all that. But the operational platform becomes the 90 to 95% of what someone does. Um, definite piece of advice I would give is to look at the integrations, not necessarily from a technical point of view, and, and that's where you know we and, and other people come in to advise the technicalities, but at a minimum to look at what sends and what receives broadly speaking i don't expect people to look at all the fields of information but at least to say i assume that if i'm using an inventory platform the sale that i do will sync to zero and yes it will in all cases but then a credit note will that sync as well then if i make a payment in zero does that come back to my inventory system um if i wanted to sell that item in my accounting system could or would that put a sale back in inventory and similar um as we know there are several hundred applications that link to uh zero and a large number that link to quickbooks as well they are not all built equally and there's a lot i don't put anyone particularly in this boat that we mentioned thus far but there are a lot especially newer players that will say we are integrated to something like zero and they just drop a sales record in and nothing else so there's no cost of goods there's no payments that come back there's no other information a um, couple of good tips and tricks for that as well um, oftentimes you can look at vendor help files or similar um, zero recently redid their app pages um, and are very good there's, there's a little image usually on the right hand side um, which will show little arrows of what sends from the application, so Venn to zero, zero to Venn, Deer to zero, zero to Deer. Um, that's worth a look, uh, A, to check it work, but also uh, in talking to a, a client, it's worth looking at um, to prompt conversations as well to say, like, ah, does that matter? What about this? And so on. So, um, that's just a point I wanted to make is kind of be wary of just something that says I integrate to zero and what that can actually mean. Um, and I might just add another point before we move on to this. Cause and literally this is kind of the, it's the million dollar question about, you know, well, you know, how simple, how simple are these systems to set up? Um, I think when you start breaking things down and hopefully what, the, what you're taking away from this is it's not really just about importing a product, supplier and uh and customer spreadsheet into a system and syncing it up to zero particularly if there are multiple sales channels so the thing that we've thing that we see quite a bit um, and this is this is just from the, the years of experience and whatnot and you know it's looking at all the different apps that enter and exit the marketplace um, the focus tends to be rightly or wrongly let's get our app that does x integrated to zero or quickbooks online so they focus there but then when you start throwing a third app into the mix uh, things can get a little bit trickier so that same concept that i, that I brought up about okay well if you integrate e-commerce or point of sale to inventory which one wants to control the uh which one wants to control the product list now let's look at from the other perspective if you integrate POS, Ecom, uh, inventory to an accounting platform like Zero or QuickBooks Online, which one wants to control the financial information? If the vendor has focused, and this tends to be more at the smaller end of the scale, with you know, and sometimes actually in Ecom, um, there, there's a local Ecom platform that uh, has a bit of this this struggle. Uh, won't name names, but yeah, which one want, wants to control the financial data? Because that's 
something that they focus heavily on so that they can start doing things like attending road shows and, and sorry to be cynical on this, but you know, they want to, they want to attend ZeroCon. They want to attend QuickBooks Connect and show their app to you guys, the accounting professionals, so that you recommend it. Okay, cool. Have they focused as much on their accounting integration as they have everything else? And, and flip that logic around. Have they only focused on their accounting integration? And it means that you're going to have a struggle then where, other, where the, the mix of apps basically are fighting each other uh, for the uh, financial information. Uh, all right. So yeah, anyway, that, let's close that topic off. Um, but I might segue then, Dan. So that question we had about the meat supplier, I might bring that back up. But I think if I'm going to interpret this, this question a little bit differently, let's talk a bit about the industry as a whole. So meat supply uh, is not dissimilar to things like uh, wood, like wood paneling and wood cutting uh, companies and things like that. I think a lot of the complexity in a, in a business like meat supply comes down to uh, variable units of measure. So mm -hmm. buying things in one scale, turning it into other things, uh, usually by cuts uh, and things like that. So we see this kind of solution quite a bit. Um, obviously, the added complexity with something like meat or any type of food where you're buying, you're buying maybe in liters, cubes, by cow, by pig, <laughs> whatever it may be, uh, and then turning it into smaller units and then maybe packing it. The complexity with food is you have batch tracking and uh, expiry dates that need to be factored in as well. Um, but Dan, what about other, so let's talk about those industries where you have variable units of measure uh, along the way. Are they, uh, do you have any sort of uh, go-tos on that? I know deer handles it quite well, um, any other thoughts on it? Yeah, I mean, the, so there's, there's a couple that do, um, so the, it, this will kind of go back to the feature list that we talked about before. So if you've got, you're right in the first instance. So the, the question, uh, I'm assuming obviously someone's got a specific client they're thinking of, but the question kind of straddles a few different areas. So it, it could be almost anything food and drink manufacturer and a few other areas as well. So, um, Instantly, you can write a whole load of things off because there's no batch tracking, production, bill of materials, and similar. So instantly, you're going to be at the higher end of solutions. So since Evan Deer Unleashed, um, to politically answer the question, what comes from uh, or where, where you go from there is going to be process dependent. So um, by that, I mean what we tend to find with providers. So we've had clients in um, uh, similar industries. So food manufacture, food processing. So the, the horrible, I get a body of animal and turn it into parts of animal. Um, and also things like wood manufacture, metal manufacture, um, plus food production, almost the opposite way from raw materials into uh, food products. Um, the main things that are going to drive you in in different directions are going to be the the processes and possibly actually um the integrations as well so channels that you're selling on and similar um you'll need to look at things like um i mean this is the kind of discussion where we spend half a day on it with a client but you will need to look at things like how you produce those wastage as well uh, so do you get um, 50 animals and produce or manufacture or work on them all together? Or is it a more of a one by one thing? Um, is it the same or similar result every time? Um, so Deer and Tin 7 are generally better with flexible bill of materials. So this time it took, let's say, for example, we're making cakes. This time it took this much sugar, this much flour, this much butter, the next time it might change again and so on. Um, the same is true as well with flow through batch numbers. So the flour has a batch number, the sugar has a batch number and so on. The cake that we make has its own batch to track that as well. Um, so in, in that case, generally where you've got um, manufacture, um, especially if there's levels of manufacture, um, 
you're generally going to be looking at the higher end there. Um, and to be very honest, generally in a lot of cases, then it will come down. So flexibility is one. We would generally knock uh, Unleashed out with a little bit less flexibility on bill of materials. Um, then generally it's price dependent and also somewhat integration dependent. There's a few specifics where Jira integrated since seven aren't and vice versa. So things like e-commerce platforms, um, sales channels and similar. A um, little bit political answer because there's a, a bundle more questions about the specifics, but you can definitely rule a whole load of things out. So um, definitely those at the higher end, if that kind of makes sense. Yeah, no, that, that all makes sense. Um, so then we've got the last of our industry specific questions here. So um, we operate a fabrication business that also sells services. What's a good solution uh, at the moment? We're running multiple systems, including spreadsheets. Okay, so um, ser services is an interesting one. Um, so we've had a we've had a couple of clients that do fabrication. So we've had a, a metal fabricators. Um, we've had a couple of engineering companies. Um, the couple it's going to be a very similar answer that immediately um some of those uh more disrespectfully lower end solutions are going to knock out straight away because um of bill of materials and things like that that the real importance is going to come down to um the phrase selling services so in terms of putting a um putting allowing labor in a bill of materials so we make this product, we need these metal rods and so on, and half an hour of labor or whatever, and allow that in our cost of goods sold and in our profit margins. Um, that's fine. Most of the higher end inventory solutions will handle that. Again, you've got to consider variability if it's different amounts of time all the time. Um, where currently, um, and I'm hopeful to see improvements in this, but where currently, I'm being very honestly, none of the providers will um, work currently is if you want to get into more like resource planning and things like that. So um, that's where people tend to blur the line between full inventory, full service and tend to then end up almost going upwards and looking towards more ERP solutions, which we don't do. We're not generally a fan of is if you need all of those inventory mechanics that we've talked about so far, and you need a whole bundle of real complex um, people mechanics like resource planning and assets and maintenance and um, scheduling. Like, is that uh, welder going to be welding tool going to be free at that time? How many jobs are queued up for it, and so on? Um, if that's the case, it's probably a deep conversation. Honestly, probably not a one system solution at the moment. If it's charging, just charging services or putting services in build materials no huge stress for the solutions we've already mentioned. And I might add to that as well. I don't think that multiple solutions is or should be viewed negatively straight away. It, if the solutions are correct and if the workflow is defined properly, it wouldn't matter whether you have one all in, uh, you know, one all inclusive software, if that's missing. You know, it, it's some, a point you made yesterday in our professional services webinar. You know, you can have uh, the most whiz bang, amazing one piece of tech in the world, but if you haven't got good processes underneath it, well, what, what's the point, right? So the same goes if you've got multiple systems. You, you, we've got to make sure that there are clear lines in the sand to know when you move from one system to another. Um, doing so should provide some value obviously like going to out of one and into another having that little break in the chain it's worth it if the system that you move into is providing excellent value for what it does if it solves problems that would otherwise be difficult then it's no big deal obviously like when we put a system in uh, we try to minimize the number of systems that we that we put in and implement because you know the term Dan uses a lot is we don't want to build Frankenstein's monster. Um, particularly if you've got API connections all over the place and Zapier in the mix, you know, if one thing in the chain breaks, you know, you open yourself up to a world of hurt. So 
we're not scared of multiple systems and we oftentimes advise clients that it is the best way to go down um, or, or to pursue. But like I, like I said already, you've got to provide value in those systems and you've got to make sure that they're doing their role exceptionally well. I think the, I'll try not to get too technical here, but a really, really important distinction and you can usually get recommendation on this from frankly experts like us or the vendors is um, everything in its right place. So um, for example, we've got clients that use Shopify at the top of what they do. So e-commerce platform, basically selling to consumers online, um, inventory system in the middle, uh, shipping system, um, and their accounting at the bottom. And there's a, uh, a pathway through all of that. So someone will go online, place an order, order drops into the inventory platform, is checked and approved, goes to the shipping platform to say, great, they're in New South Wales, send it with Australia Post, they're in the US, send it with FedEx, whatever, and goes into the accounting system once it's all approved and shipped. Perfectly fine, four systems, perfectly fine. Situation you don't want is client places an order, order goes into all four systems and then client emails and says, oh crap, I don't live at 12 Blue Street, I live at 14 Blue Street. Then you have to change that in all four systems. They'll start erroring when they start sending information to each other. And as Matt said, then you've got Frankenstein's monster. So there is a little bit of a fear um, that people have of like, we need to live in one system. Not true providing everything's got its place and you've got a process in behind it. Absolutely what you don't want, back to an earlier point, you don't want systems fighting for control. So you don't want three systems trying to do the same thing. Um, and you wanna make sure that there's a process and wrapping this all back around, how the integration works so that information can actually flow between the things and similar. Um, all of those together are, are so important, but yeah, there's got to be a political answer. There's two, two different schools of thought. There's got to be a reason for looking to go outside into another platform. If it's a 2% part of your process, don't be scared of doing something manual. Don't be scared of pulling something out to a spreadsheet. If you do it once a week, who cares? If it's core to what you do, you absolutely don't want to create multiple sources of truth. But we've seen clients before that have can hang on the one percent of things and you'll never get anywhere in that case yeah um something i might add to it um we've got a client that we're working with and i think something that we've figured out in in all of our consultation really is the way that they sell services and price services is actually quite simple so there was this there was this uh kind of instant uh, reaction to not having this one in all inclusive sort of platform that they didn't they didn't find favorable but on picking it apart a bit more it turned out that their services were really just on site basically on site quick installations they calculated the price of the installation using a fixed uh, rate system which uh, basically was that they sell a product by the square meter and they install it using the exact same uh, square meterage uh, number. So if, you're, if they're installing 40 square meters of product, their service charge is 40 times uh, the labor charge. And then it's just having to book someone to go out. And I was, uh, the conversation I had was, okay, well, your budget's here. You've got only a small workforce going out and doing the actual work. Why can't you just do it in a calendar? All of the other work was happening in store, face to face. They were negotiating their prices. All that stuff was happening there with the client there, not, not out on site. Um, there, was, there is not really a resource planning component for them other than knowing whether, when they can book someone in to do it and whether someone's on leave or not. It was, it was that kind of simple. So we've got down to the point where it's like, well, you already have... Google Calendar <laughs> and all of your guys that are out on the job are using Google Calendar. Well, but they're kind of using it. They're not really using it. Why don't we focus on getting them to use Google Calendar properly first 
And considering all that negotiation is happening there, all you need is an inventory system. You can then just look at the calendar and say, yeah, we can slot you in for two hours here. Um, let's get that part right before we start looking to try and reinvent the wheel a bit. Let's, let's, let's focus there, get the processes and procedures right. And then if you start finding bottlenecks later on, then we'll look at something that does, you know, fleet management and whatnot. But for four guys out on the road, just installing things like that wasn't necessary. Um, so we've got a couple more questions. And at this point, just as we are getting to the three quarter mark, I just want to remind the participants that we've got the Q and A section down the bottom. So we've got a couple of questions in there uh, that will get answered at the end. Um, but if you have thought of anything, if there's anything that you would like to know, jump in there, type the question in and we'll answer it uh, coming up soon. So uh, Dan, we've got a question here. Uh, and I think we've answered much of this already, but let's, let's do a short answer on this that's a bit more specific. I've got a client that runs uh, Shopify and they want to start selling on Amazon and eBay. How would an inventory system help them? I think that's, that's a quick answer. Um, yeah, I, I agree. So I think we, we've talked about a lot of the, of the broad concepts previously, but probably most... Uh, most appropriately there, it's going to be centralizing information. So there's the obvious that you have a stock level in your warehouse. Shopify can see it. Amazon can see it. eBay can see it. So you, you have different channels that don't sell out. You don't have to say we're selling 100 on eBay, 50 on Amazon, and so on. Um, the other side is probably information-based. So if you have a new product launch, season launch, or whatever, drop that information into your inventory, sync it to all the channels, and they will have... Same photos, same information, same description, and so on. It's probably a central hub, basically, without knowing more about processes. Yeah. Um, and we've got a question here. Is this the question that got asked yesterday? So uh, one of the attendees that attended both sessions or is attending both sessions asked the same question for both. And I think it's, it's really great. Um, what tips and tricks do you have to get information from software vendors? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, Careful how I answer this because this video is going to some of them. Um, so it, there's a few different things. So this kind of goes back to qualifying out rather than qualifying in. So a couple of really good tips and tricks. So first of all, um, feature tick boxes. Um, look at those and look at the feet or look at what something doesn't have. So obviously a vendor's page may not always say we don't do this but you can work it out backwards. The reason I say that is because we, um, you may see that a platform can handle batch numbers. Doesn't necessarily mean they can handle it in the way that you, your process needs, but you know that at least if someone doesn't scratch that, it's not gonna work for us. Um, the flip side of this that I would say is there's two good places um, to kind of reverse that information. Totally agree with what you said, Matt, about demos. There are demos on online. Vendors will do demos. They are useful. I would definitely look at one for look and feel of a system, but the vendor's going to need to know this is how we do this and what our process is to, to know a bit more about you. Um, if you can't find videos online, demo information or similar like that, that's a worry straight away. It usually means the platform's a bit of a dog's breakfast or not experienced or similar. Most things you should be able to find you know, it's YouTube or similar. Um, the other sort of clever little reverse trick is most, most vendors have obviously help file um, information. Most will also have feature requests. So most of the add-ons because they're web-based will update anywhere from every week to every quarter um, and have feature request pages. They're not always publicly accessible, which I totally get from the vendor side because they want to hear feedback from clients using the system, not necessarily Bob that thinks the client it's appropriate and it isn't. Um, but most, if you ask, will tell you these are three or four really popular things and, and potentially where they are in a timeline. Um, hopefully, it, that doesn't matter to you. It's not something that's important to your usage, but it's good to kind of highlight because no one sales pitch is ever going to tell you this is what we don't do. Um, the other little thing I would ask is um, 
if you speak to a vendor or partner or similar like us, um, without focusing on, do you have another client like us who is a four person meat manufacturer based in this suburb with a company name beginning with A, um, I'd at least be asking like, food manufacturer clients, do you do you have any, what experience do you have with them? At least so that when uh, there's a ubiquitous term like bill of material, that you know there's other clients using it in a similar way with wastage, with things like that. Um, they're probably the little kind of hack tips and tricks. Mm. Um, yeah, they're, they're probably the biggest things to, to get, primarily qualifying out rather than qualifying in, if that kind of makes sense. There are a couple of good ones there. Yeah. A little point I'll add just on uh, when you're looking for similar clients, don't look for the snowflake example. You know, don't, don't look for the, say that. yeah, don't look for the exact, exact same type of client and um, no disrespect in inventory. And in a lot of solutions, there's, a, there's a little bit of a upfront uh, assumption that oh, my business is very unique and, and whatnot. It's not always true. Just go broad. You just generally in the industry, um, in food manufacturing, in fabrication, all that, generally speaking, the processes might be slightly different, but the problems are all the same. Um, and certainly something we say to clients a lot of the time is, you know, sell us your business tomorrow. We know that we could install this system into it and it'll run just fine. Um, nuance in processes is important, but yeah, when you're looking for uh, industry proof, focus on the industry not process proof straight away. No, that, that's probably a, a good thing just to, to help narrow things down, but not get too deep in the weeds. Um, all right, our last pre-sent uh, question is a long one, and then we've got two that are gonna be answered live. So uh, the long one, it's about project management, and uh, by that I mean implementation projects, so a little bit more specific to what we do. Um, how much time and resource should be dedicated to moving inventory systems? And at what point should a client look at a specialist like us instead of just getting, uh, sorry, in their words, instead of just getting us, so I'm assuming their accountant, uh, to import the data for them? Uh, okay, so um, it's a little bit how long is a piece of string, but I'll, I'll try and give a few tips and tricks again. So, um, Obviously, as we mentioned from the start, this is kind of exactly what we do, so I'll kind of leave the sales pitch at the door. Um, in terms of time resource, obviously it's very much gonna depend on size of company. Um, someone who's getting five or 10 orders a month from clients is gonna need a very different uh, process than someone that's getting 500 orders a day through their e-commerce platform. Um, the things that I would say regardless, uh, if I can summarize them, that are regardless of company size or structure or similar, um, someone needs ownership. So not necessarily how much resource, but what resource. Um, someone in the business needs a mandate to, to do this work, even if you're using an expert. Matt mentioned just before, we tell every client this, like, cool, if you go to a provider and said, great, here is my business, come and use the system tomorrow, people could do that. You could get one of Dia's reps, Unleashed reps to walk in and do it because they, you know, we, we use this system day in, day out. Um, the important thing is getting yourself slash your client up and running. Someone needs to take that on. Um, ideally, someone that's at a reasonable level that they've got decision-making doesn't have to be the owner or similar, but they have to be able to say, cool, that's the way we're going to do it. That's what's going to happen here. Um, ideally as well, um, they've got resource to write like processes, guides, things like that. Um, I'd recommend, so, so uh, as an example, regardless of size, when we work with a client, it's generally around a couple of month process. Um, we've also got clients that come to us having set things up themselves and just needing kind of ad hoc, um, kind of tidy up and help. Um, Generally, I find those clients have taken about two months as well. So let's kind of use that as a bit of a ballpark. Um, if you're doing something over kind of a couple of months, I allow probably an hour or two every day or two. Um, 
rather than saying, I'm going to do this on a Monday every week for two reasons. One, it's far too intense and far too much time between drinks. Um, additionally, you'll find just peaks and troughs in resourcing. It's a lot easier to say, you know, I'll stop, I'll get all of our shipments and deliveries and everything away today by one o'clock and then I'll do an hour or two of learning the system or getting our product list together or similar. Um, keep a single person, ideally, single source of truth, single person working on it, single person getting upskilled. Um, yeah, probably an hour or two a day, every day or two. Ideally, try not to get to a situation that someone is not doing it for a couple of days or more because then people tend to get weary of the process or forget things or similar. Um, other general little tips and tricks, watch out for really obvious stuff. Like if you've got a massive industry expo, don't try and go live at the same time. Um, Black Friday, Christmas sales, Mother's Day, Father's Day, all that kind of stuff. Um, and without getting too sales pitchy or too arrogant, what like when to use an expert is someone's got to take this resource. Someone's got to take this risk. If you don't want to be the one to do it, find an expert. That's kind of as simple as like all these things I'm talking about are being brutally honest we've seen it before someone's made the mistake before that's probably the single biggest reason to to outsource it is reduce the risk of the cost and the resource um yeah i just about got that wrapped up in two minutes <laughs> um and i might just add one little bugbear to that as well don't wait until subscriptions for things like netsuite or sap or whatever are a month away from renewal that's uh that should especially when you're taking a looking to take a client out of that which which happens quite a bit because, you know, rewind 10 to 15 years ago, it was you using your accounting system, a spreadsheet or an ERP. That was kind of <laughs> where, where the, the market was at. So you've got an increasing number of people now that can per, are perfectly suited for these more mid-tier products. Um, and they're starting to realize that usually there's a change of ownership or something like that or new management and they're going, hey, we're spending you know, thousands of dollars a month on X. We don't need that. Um, we can do it in Y. Don't wait until the subscription for X is, you know, up a month from now and say, all right, we want to go live in a month. That's usually going to be a lot more complex than that. And unfortunately, it's something that happens quite a bit still. So uh, a lot of <laughs> measure timeline expectations. A lot of people have a habit. It's a very weird comment, but a lot of people have a habit of sadism in this case. We, we have clients that will yeah. come to us and say, we want to go live. Like the, the next one coming up is Christmas has some kind of impact on all of our inventory projects, either because they're a retailer. So Christmas is carnage or they're a wholesaler. So they're busy till about October. Then they've actually got a nice little window. Um, and the number of times people will talk to us and say, great, what do you recommend? Generally, we take a couple of months. If we were talking to someone right now, we'd be saying you could be live about the end of November, mid-November, and won't mention other things going on in the business to then find that actually at the end of November, there's a huge industry workshop and they expect a thousand orders and it's fine, we'll make it work. Like, don't do that shit. There is no need to do that. Yeah. Um, and the right kind of partner or the right kind of internal person will push back on that. Like there's, there's a lot of pressure and a lot of risk in this kind of work that doesn't need to be any more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So we are onto the live question. So I've got two here and I realize we've hit the hour. So let's um, actually, they're not, they're not hugely complex questions either. They're, they're quite straightforward. Uh, so the first one here uh, we've got is, should we do B2B sales via a dedicated platform or can we just do it with e-commerce? Uh, good question. So um, for, for any of these live questions, we'll put the web link and things up. If you need more detail, I won't get into too much technicality for time. Um, good question. The most uh, generally B2B, B2C, so business to business, business to consumer, is generally pretty split down the middle. So normally an e-commerce platform would be uh, B2B, whether it's through like a portal, since Evan, Deer and Unleashed all have, or whether it's something you design. A um, few reasons for that. One is seeing existing orders, doing reorders, downloading invoices, seeing exact stock levels, price lists, things that you show people who are a little bit closer to you, like distributors and similar. 
Uh, B2C, like Shopify and similar, is normally e-commerce because you've got platforms to sell on like Facebook, Instagram, um, Google Shopping, mm -hmm. and you've got things like taking payments in advance. Um, there's usually quite a specific split. So there are cases where you might do B2B through e-commerce, but it's the rarity rather than the norm. Normally it's split and I do them in their separate areas. Yeah, and I'd, I'd add to that. So it's generally not a good idea to try and shoehorn uh, your B2B into your retail B2C shopping cart experience. Um, it, it, there's some complexity around things like price lists and account terms and things like that, which don't often uh, translate very well. Um, where we've seen it work best is still split. So um, we've got a few clients that have very, very specific brand guidelines uh, and experiential guidelines that they wanted to extend to their wholesale clients. They don't want just a, a you know, no disrespect, a bland B2B portal um, because of the type of product that they sell being a bit more premium. Um, but what they have done and the right way to do it is it is a two e-commerce uh, system set up so they have one that is their retail experience they have one that is just for wholesale they are separate so they'll have like a Shopify enterprise with two separate stores underneath it each one of them has its own themes its own branding its own workflows and whatnot that are built into the e-commerce experience uh, for b2b and b2c and that tends to be the way that I've seen it work best um, and the last question here uh, is a deer inventory specific one. Uh, how complex can the bill of materials in deer be? Can it handle multiple stages? Uh, I was going to say yes. How complex can it be? Yes. Yes. Um, uh, within reason, as complex as you want it to be, um, there's process specific things that are a bit technical and I won't get into, but um, no great issue having, um, I'll use the example we use with various people here. So we've got uh, a few different clients that are in uh, food and beverage manufacturers that we spoke about before. Um, Alcohol is the good example. You turn grain into green beer, green beer into brown beer, put it into bottles, put it into cases, put that into pallets, um, all handleable. Process is super, super important for that. Um, and also thinking about like labor and services that we talked about earlier. Um, but without being too simplistic for time, nothing scary there, particularly. Okay. And no hard limit. Yep. Oh, good. And that's, uh, that's it. That was the last question. So we've come in just a little over time. Um, and I want to thank everyone for sticking around. Um, if you have any questions as follow up to this, if you're referring back later on and you think, oh, I should have asked something, just get in touch with us. Jump on our website, so wearewaypoint.com, and a nice little chat bot will pop up. Um, and uh, yeah, you can schedule a phone call ahead of time at a time that suits you, and we'll give you a buzz and we'll have a chat to you about any of the topics or others that we've brought up today.